هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما جاء بعض السستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so I ended up missing a halaqa uh, two weeks back and due to that we're actually going to have to combine two topics together and it's two really strange topics that shouldn't come together but we're going to force them together the first topic is how to raise righteous children bithinillahi ta'ala and then the second part of the halaqa will be about how to get divorced according to the sunnah <laughs> so you can figure out how they go together Allah knows best so let us begin bithinillahi ta'ala speaking about children the first discussion we want to have is what is heavier on the scales of an individual? Righteousness towards one's parents or righteousness towards one's children? Now the obvious answer in most people's mind, they will probably say that it is righteousness towards one's parents. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses a question uh, in the Quran by saying, That your parents or your children, you do not know who will be more beneficial to you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses this question. Then another aspect that scholars bring to this discussion is when we talk about when a person passes away, what benefits a person when they pass away? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions three things that benefit a person after they pass away. The first thing he mentions is knowledge that he has left behind that people benefit from. The second thing he mentions is a sadaqa jariyah. Meaning it is a charity that self plenishes itself, building a madrasa, building a masjid, building a well. Okay, so the second thing that benefits the dead person is the sadaqah jariyah. And that is the, the sadaqah that self plenishes itself. So we mentioned building a masjid, building a madrasa, building a well. All of these things will continue to benefit a person after they pass away. And then the third thing the Messenger of Allah وسلم, mentions is the righteous child that seeks forgiveness for their parents. The righteous child that seeks forgiveness for their parents. There's actually a funny joke. Actually, I'll leave all the jokes for later. You guys were terrible last week. No one laughed. <laughs> Even my wife's watching. She's like, why isn't anyone laughing? <laughs> we'll leave the jokes for later, inshallah. طيب. So that was the third thing. So here we see another aspect to this discussion is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that the things that will benefit you after you pass away was not the obedience to your parents, but rather it was the righteousness and the tarbiyah that you gave to your children. Then a third aspect to this, a third aspect to this, is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he talks about the children that are hafad, that they memorize the Quran, that they will put crowns on the heads of their parents. They will put crowns on the heads of their parents. Whereas had the parents been hafad, then it doesn't necessarily affect the children. So this is the third aspect that scholars bring into the discussion. Now our point of mentioning this is not to come to a conclusion that you know, where does more righteousness lie? Our point to mention this is that just as much righteousness as we show to our parents and we understand this concept because it's repeated all the time, we need to repeat the same concept towards our children as well because they are just as deserving of showing righteousness and giving them good tarbiyah and giving them an up, a good upbringing too as well. So with that having been said, let us now discuss what are the rights of a child in Islam? What are the rights of a child in Islam? So we'll mention... Uh, six of them bidden Allah Ta'ala. We'll mention six of them bidden Allah Ta'ala. The first of them is choosing a righteous mother for that child. The first of them is choosing a righteous mother for that child. A man comes to Imam Ahmad rahimahullah and he says, I would like to ensure that my child is righteous. What can I do? So Imam Ahmad asks him, how old is your child? And he tells him, my child is six months old. Imam Ahmad responds by saying, you're already six months too late. You're already six months too late. Meaning the righteousness of your child, it begins by choosing a righteous mother for that child. Right? If you want a righteous child, it, choose, it starts by choosing a righteous mother for that child. 
And this is why I cannot emphasize enough to the brothers that when you decide to get married, make the deen something very, very heavy on your scales of decision. Don't just go for the looks. Don't just go maybe for the money that she has, but make deen very, very heavy. Because right now you may not be thinking about children, but eventually it kicks in that you do want to have children. And once that decision comes into play, you will need a righteous spouse to help you in that to be the Allah Ta'ala. So that is the first right of the child, that they have a righteous uh, mother. And obviously the father has to be righteous as well. That's understood. Number two, is that a good name is chosen for that child. A good name is chosen for that child. So in an authentic hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions that the two most beloved names to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for a boy are Abdullah and Abdurrahman. These are the two most beloved names to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for a boy, Abdullah and Abdurrahman. And then he goes on to mention in the conclusion of this hadith that a lot of people don't know, is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes on to say, and the most truthful of names are Al-Harith and Hamam. The most truthful of names are Al-Harith and Hamam. So these four names the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically recommended. Now continuing with the names of the boys, if you decide not to choose these names, then choose the names of the Prophets. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentions 25 Prophets in the Quran, choose any of those names, those are good names to have. If you decide not to choose the name of the Prophets, then choose the names of the well-known companions. Choose the names of the well-known companions, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, uh, and the rest of them. Choose the names of the well-known companions. And then if even that you decide not to go with this, then choose a name that has a good meaning with it at least. Choose a name that has a good meaning with it at least. And here's something that you know, might shock a lot of people. Does the child's name have to be something in Arabic? Does the child's name have to be something in Arabic? And the answer to that is no. That if there's a word that has a nice meaning in your language, you can name your child with that name even if it's not in Arabic. Even if it's not in Arabic. Now moving on to the girls' names. What should the girls do in this situation? So for the girls, we have a similar advice. The righteous women that are mentioned in the Quran, we should choose their names. So who can tell me what righteous women are mentioned in the Quran? Which righteous women are mentioned in the Quran? Maryam, Maryam excellent. Who else? Asiya. Asiya. She is mentioned in the Quran as well. So these are two examples of righteous women mentioned in the Quran. Then you have the names of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. So you have Khadija, you have Aisha, you have Sauda. All of these names are good. Then you have the names of the daughters of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Who can remind me what were the names of the daughters of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ? So Fatima is the easiest one. Excellent. Um Kalthum, excellent. Ruqayya, excellent. And Zainab is the last one. Excellent. So these are the names of the daughters of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Then you move on to the righteous female companions that were known. Can anyone think of righteous female companions that were known during the time of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ that were not his wives or his daughters? Sumayya, excellent, good. Who else? Asma, the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha. Excellent. Can we think of one more? Think of Battle of Uhud. This story is very common. Sorry? Um Salama was the wife of the Messenger of Allah. Think of Battle of Uhud, the woman that was defending the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Who remembers? I'll give, Halima was the caretaker of the Messenger of Allah, but I'll give you her kunya. Her kunya was Um Ammara bint Kaab. What was her name? Um Ammara bint Kaab. <laughs> Should I start spelling it out with a noon? Come on, noon. The first letter is noon. Nusayba <laughs> bint Kaab. Come on, <laughs> you guys knew this name, right? Uh, yeah, most of you should know this name, subhanAllah. It's a very common name from the Battle of Ahad. Yeah, this is the one female companion that the Messenger of Allah as is a tribute to him. He said that, you know, at times she was on my right, at times she was in front of me, at times she was behind me. And she actually stuck uh, her hand out to defend the Messenger of Allah to take an arrow. So she got injured for the sake of the Messenger of Allah So this is, uh, uh, you know, one of the righteous female companions. So that is what we would recommend for the sisters. So that is the second right of the child, that you give the child a good name. The third right that the scholars mention, and this right is something which is differed upon, but we're going to mention it anyways, because the majority of the scholars actually encourage it. And that is the giving of the adhan in the year of the child. The giving of the adhan in the year of the child. So the adhan should be given in the right year of the child 
And this should preferably be done by the father himself. If the father does not know how or is unable to give it, then any other male relative is fine. Then any other male relative is fine. Now the issue with the Adhan is that if you look at the chain of transmission of this hadith, it actually seems there's a weakness in this hadith. So two issues come up. Issue number one is the issue of authenticity of the hadith. And then issue number two is are you allowed acting upon weak hadith? Are you allowed acting upon weak hadith? So then the scholars took different opinions. First group of scholars, they said, you know what? This hadith is authentic, so there's no issue whatsoever. The second group of scholars, they said, we recognize there's a weakness in this hadith, yet we're going to allow to do the action upon weak hadith if the weakness in the hadith is something minor, meaning it's not a major weakness, meaning that it doesn't have any major liars in the hadith, and the hadith within of itself does not contradict the a verse in the Quran or another common hadith, then they allowed it, and this was the opinion of the majority. Related to this very issue, related to this very issue is the issue of the giving of the aqama, giving of the aqama in the left ear of the child. And this is something that is completely weak and has no basis to it whatsoever. So this is something fabricated and something that should not be done. Something that is made up and should not be done. The fourth right of the child is what they call a tahnik. And the tahnik over here is referring to the placing of a chewed date in the mouth of a child. Is the placing of a chewed date in the mouth of a child. And it's not a whole date, but it's referring to chewing on a little bit and putting it on the palate of the mouth. Putting it on the palate of the mouth. Over here, this hadith is clearly authentic. But what the scholars differed on over here is what was the wisdom behind this? Was the wisdom behind this to seek tabarruk from the Messenger of Allah, meaning seeking the barakah of the Messenger of Allah? Because it was only reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did this and none of the other companions did this. Or was there some sort of medical wisdom behind it that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was trying to allude to? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It seems that the stronger opinion is the second. That this was an act that was purely for the sake of tabar uh, sorry, it is the first opinion that is uh, closer to the truth, which is that this was an act of tabarak from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that after the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was not practiced by any of the companions as far as we know, as far as we know. So that was number four. Number five, the aqiqah of the child. The aqiqah of the child. When you study the rulings in Islam, you'll notice that every action in Islam is divided into one of five categories. Do you guys remember this discussion? Every action in Islam is divided into one of five categories. Who can remind me what those five categories are? Give me one of them. Wajib. So something that is wajib. What are the other four? Mustahab. Something which is mustahab. Excellent. Mubah. Who said mubah? Mubah. <laughs> Excellent. We're left with two more. Something which is makruh. And then what is the last one? Haram, something which is haram. So wajib, let us understand these definitions properly. When we say something is wajib, meaning that the one who does it, he is rewarded, and the one who leaves it off is punished. So the one who does it is rewarded, the one that leaves it off is punished. Mustahab, the one who does it is rewarded, but the one who does not do it is not punished. So the one that does it is rewarded, the one that does not do it is not punished. Mubah, you're not rewarded, nor are you punished. Makruh, the one that does it is not punished, but the one that stays away from it is rewarded. The one that does it is not punished, but the one that stays away from it is rewarded. And then the fifth and last one is haram, the one that does it is punished, and the one that abstains from it is rewarded. So every action in Islam will fall under one of five categories. Now when you talk about mustahab, we talk about that which is recommended. The scholars are almost in agreement that the most recommended act that was recommended by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the act of Aqiqah. Was the act of Aqiqah. That is, it is on the borderline of something which is compulsory, but they said, no, it is something that is highly recommended. With the exception of Ibn Hazm and his followers, they said, no, it was something which is wajib. But this is an important thing to understand because in our times, the Aqiqah is taken very, very lightly. They're like, you know, I'll do it if I want to. Oh, you know, uh, I don't want to do it right now, so I'll just leave it off. But in the eyes of the scholars of Islam, the aqiqah was something very, very relevant. Because this was the way that you show shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses your child for you. In response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses your child for you. So now what does one have to do for an aqiqah? For the boy, it is two sheep. 
For a boy, it is two sheep. For a girl, it is one sheep. For a girl, it is one sheep. Another uh, thing to understand is the dates for the Aqiqah. So it is recommended to do the Aqiqah on the 7th. If not on the 7th, then on the 14th. And then if not on the 14th, then on the 21st. And if you can't do it on the 21st, then any day after that is fine. Then any day after that is fine. Related to this point is, what if your parents didn't have an Aqiqah for you when you were born? That maybe, let's just say, you know, it was a financial issue, they couldn't afford it, or they didn't know, or you know what, they didn't like you as a child, so they decided, you know what, no Aqiqah for you. Can you do your own Aqiqah? The answer to this is yes. Even when you grow older, you can do your own Aqiqah. This is a way to show appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another issue related to this. What if we come to a time where subhanAllah, you know, may Allah not allow this to happen except with His wisdom, that you know, sheep are completely extinct. You have no more sheep. What do you do in that situation? Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically mentioned sheep over here. So in such a situation, the scholars said that it, the most preferable thing to do is to get a sheep. But if you can't get a sheep, then take its closest example. So the closest example would be something like a goat. And if you can't get a goat, then get shares in a cow or shares in a camel. Then this would be like the closest thing. And then they actually like, okay, so how many chickens would be the equivalent? And they said something like 10 chickens. And then what if you don't get chickens, you only have eggs. How many eggs would you have to do? And literally, they went this far. I don't remember how many eggs it was, but it would be a lot of eggs. <laughs> and you can imagine, you know, you show up to Nakika and people are like starving for the food. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're serving them boiled eggs. <laughs> Good. Okay, so that was number five. That was number five. The sixth and last right of the child, the sixth and last right of the child is the shaving of the head. Is the shaving of the head. And this is something that should be done on the seventh day as well. This is something that should be done on the seventh day as well. Now, the important thing to understand over here is not just the shaving of the head, but it is the collecting of the hair at that time and giving its weight in silver out in charity giving its weight out in silver in charity. And re in reality, this is something very, very cheap. Like even, you know, subhanAllah, you look at the trend of silver in the last like four or five years, it's skyrocketed. There was a time silver was like $2 an ounce. Now it's like close to $30, $40 an ounce. But even at its most expensive rate, the sadaqah that you end up giving is close to like 10 to $15. You know, that's if you have like a desi, or like a hairy child, <laughs> that's what you end up doing. But if it's like your average child, then you're not gonna end up giving much in sadaqah at all. The important thing to understand about shaving of the head. There's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he prohibited women from shaving of their head. Where he prohibited women from shaving of their head. So the issue arises now, here you have the prohibition of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibiting the women from shaving their heads. And then the baby child where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged the shaving of the head. What did you do in this situation? The majority of the scholars went to the opinion that you go ahead and you shave the opinion of the baby. This hadith only applies to the grown woman. This hadith only applies to the grown woman. But there are certain scholars of hadith that said, no, this uh, hadith of shaving of the head only applies to the male child and does not apply to the female child. And does not apply to the female child. And in this opinion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It seems that the opinion of the majority is stronger. It seems that the opinion of the majority is stronger. And there you have the six rights of the child. Who's going to repeat them for me, inshallah? Uh, you have a question? Uh, I can repeat them, but I had a question. Okay, we'll take questions at the end, inshallah. Which one was the majority's opinion? The majority is that you should go ahead and shave the, the, ba the female baby's head as well and give it in charity. So who's going to repeat the six? Go ahead, start me off with two. Uh, a good name. A good name, excellent. Uh, they must keep, teach them Quran. They must teach them Quran. <laughs> You've been attending a different dars, brother. <laughs> a righteous mother and a good name. Excellent. So we have four more to go. Akika. Akika. Who said Akika? Excellent. So there we have Akika. The issue of the Adhan. Issue of the Adhan. Excellent. That's four. The date in the mouth. And what is the last one? Shaving of the head. So those are the six. Those are the six. Now, with that having been said, let us move into education of the child, making sure that the child is righteous. There's two important issues that, again, we trivialize over here. Number one is the issue of the parents or the effect of the parents in their righteousness upon the children. 
And this has two sides to it. One is the spiritual aspect, and then one is the tangible aspect. If you notice in Surah Al-Kahf, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the two children whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved their treasure for them? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about their parents? That their father was a righteous man. Their father was a righteous man. The scholars derived from this verse in the Quran that the righteousness of the parents will transcend onto the children. Meaning not that they will become righteous. Not that they will become righteous, but that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them special care due to the righteousness of the parents. Due to the righteousness of the parents. And this is an important point to understand. That just because you have a righteous parent, it does not necessitate that you will have a righteous child. Who can give me an example from the Quran about this? No. Nuh alayhi salam, exactly. Nuh was a, a, a prophet of Allah from the Ulul Azam, meaning the elevated status of prophets, yet even his own child was a disbeliever. He didn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it does not necessitate that a righteous parent will bring about a righteous child, but rather this is the one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them. So that is the spiritual element that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless children due to the righteousness of their parents. Now the tangible aspect of this is that parent, the children naturally grow up emulating their parents. Children naturally grow up emulating their parents. And I'm going to show you something the exact opposite. Let us move to Salatul Eid. Salatul Eid. On Salatul Eid, you have a three-year-old young boy. He sees his father go down into sajda for the very first time. He starts shouting, Baba, Baba, what are you doing? Are you okay? Is everything okay? Like, why did you fall to the floor? Why did that child have that reaction? Because that is the first time he's seeing his father ever perform sajda in his life. The child is confused. So, where? This, happened, this actually happened on Salatul Eid. <laughs> and we're not going to mention who it was. But the point is that subhanAllah, this is the reality of the situation. That this child, now when he grows up, you want him to pray salah. How do you expect him to pray when he never saw you pray? And you'll notice that, let's move to the positive aspect of this now. For those of you that have young children, when it comes time for salah, whether you tell your children or not, they will naturally come and make sajda or ruku with you or will recite surah fatiha behind you and they love saying ameen. They know nothing of surah fatiha, but when it comes to ameen, they love shouting out ameen. What does this show you? It shows you that the child is going to copy and emulate everything that you do. So this is about the righteousness of the parent. And this is the most important component of educating your child. Meaning that if you as a parent are not willing to become righteous, it is almost foolish on your behalf to expect your child to ever become righteous. Because righteousness begins in the home. You can send your child to any madrasa, to any Sunday school, send them to the University of Medina, doesn't matter what happens, if you did not show righteousness at home, then growing up to be righteous becomes very difficult. It becomes very difficult because it's not first nature to them. So this is the first element. If you want a righteous child, it starts with you being righteous yourself. The second element, is the element of dua, is the element of dua. Dua of the parent for the child is such a powerful tool. It's used in the positive and in the negative. So you'll notice that in Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about the Ibad al-Rahman. The Ibad al-Rahman are the select group of slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He reaffirms for them their worship for Ar-Rahman. And then He records for them a dua that they make. They make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا كُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا That they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that O oh, our Lord bestow upon us from our wives and from our children those that are the coolness of our eyes and make us leaders of the righteous. Make us an example for the righteous. Now, here you look at the dua that the select slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they're not just busy making dua for themselves, but they make dua for their spouses and for their children. And you see the same thing with Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he makes dua, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِي That from my progeny, let them be, you know, uh, groups of people that worship you and pray to you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that is, uh, you know, again, something that is forgotten. That you need to be constantly making dua for your child all the time in your salawat, when you're making dua for yourself throughout the day and the night, especially the recommended periods. So in the last third of the night, while you're fasting, when you open your fast, uh, during times of hardship and difficulty, all of these times are times where Allah answers the dua. So make dua for your children at that time. So that is in terms of the Islamic education of your child and in terms of raising him righteousness. 
Now let us go into what are the actual needs of a child? What are the actual needs of a child? And we're going to divide this into three categories. We're going to divide this into three categories. Category number one is love. Category number one is love. That every child needs love. Every child needs love. And this is what you'll notice that in each stage of your life as a human being, you're going to need a specific type of love. That if you don't have that love, that your psychological state will be deficient. So as a young child, that child needs the love of its parents. It grows older, it needs the loves of its siblings. It grows older, and now it needs the love of its spouse. Now focusing on this very first age, the love of the parents. What does love of the parents actually mean over here? Love of the parents means that it has the genuine best interests of the child in mind. And you'll notice that the number one mistake that parents make with their children after the religious aspect of things is that they love their children upon their terms rather than on the terms of the child. What exactly does this mean? So for example, let us look at the father. The father, he will love his child when he comes home. He'll take his time. He'll spend five minutes with the child, but then he'll go back to doing his own thing. And in those five minutes, hugs and kisses and, oh, I love you, how was your day? And all that conversation takes place. But once the father gets busy, he does not care about the child anymore. From a mother's perspective, it's the exact opposite. That mothers tend to overlove their children. So what ends up happening? The mother, she cooks breakfast for the child all the way till he's 18. She ties his shoes till he's 12 years old. She makes his bed till he's like 25. And she like makes, you know, plays video games with him or something like that. This sort of person at the age of 30, when he's ready to get married, he's going to be a spoiled brat. He's going to abuse his wife in the sense that he's going to need his wife to do everything for him. He can't do anything by himself. So from the mother's perspective, we say it's the exact opposite. She needs to bring that tone of love down. That you know, by the time they're hitting 12, 13, you want to start making them independent. Start making them do things for themselves, especially things like tying their shoes. I'll tell you a funny story. I was in grade two or grade three, I can't remember. If you were eight, what grade would you be in? Grade, grade three, whatever, grade two or grade three. There was like, we would come back from gym class and you'd have to change your shoes. You weren't allowed wearing the same shoes in gym class. And there was a student in our class, he couldn't tie his shoes. He would have to get the gym teacher to tie his shoes for him after you know, the, they, they got into their gym clothes. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, you know, eight years old, how could you not know how to tie your shoes? What ended up happening was exactly what I'm telling you, that every single day, the mother would wake up, she would bring him to the door, tie his shoes for him, for him and he never learned how to tie his shoes. <laughs> the sad thing is all of you know, the, that grade finished and he never learned how to tie his shoes. So I'm like wondering, did he ever learn? <laughs> so that's, that's when mothers go to the exact opposite extreme. So you need to learn to love your children in accordance to what they need. In accordance to what they need. So what does this exactly mean? Number one is that your love for your child has to be unconditional. It has to be unconditional. And there's two aspects to this. Aspect number one is that even if your child is a disappointment, you still need to love your child. So you'll notice that children are congratulated when they do well in school, when they get good grades. But the second they don't understand something, the second they do something terrible, all of a sudden we start throwing out the worst of names. And mashallah, especially the Arabs, you know, they go all out. You know, Ibn al-Kalb and Ibn al-Himar and all this other stuff, they'll start calling their children. Like, I'm not going to say what that means, but you know what I'm talking about. So all these names start flying out. But for that child, the love has to be unconditional. Whether he's successful or whether he is a failure, you are still a parent and you need to show that unconditional love to increase the confidence inside the child. The second aspect of this unconditional love is that part of loving your child is learning when not to love your child. Part of loving your child is learning when not to love your child. So for example, this issue of tying the shoes, we'll go back to that. A time will come when the child is like four years old, five years old. You tell them, look, I'm not going to tie your shoes anymore. I'll show it to you. Then you try it yourself. And this is how the child will learn. Same thing as he gets older. He needs to you know, put on his jacket and zip it up. You let them do it for themselves. They need to do their homework. They don't understand their homework. Show them how to do it, but don't do it for them. Don't do it for them. You know, and this is how you learn to love your child by taking a step back. You learn to love your child by taking a step back. The second need of the child is the need for deen, is the need for deen. 
Now, the need for deen, you know, I do not know how to explain this better than the story of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. The story of Imam, Imam, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. Let me share his story with you. Imam al-Bukhari will jump ahead in his life. He's 19 years old. He's written his first book now. And he's studying with his shaykh, Ishaq ibn Rahawai rahimahullah ta'ala. And Ishaq ibn Rahawai, he says, I wish that there would be someone who would compile all the authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Imam al-Bukhari, he gets inspired with this. Lo and behold, he begins a mission for 16 years, for 16 years to compile Sahih al-Bukhari. So the Sahih al-Bukhari that we know of, it took him 16 years to write. Now what is the extremely unique thing about Sahih al-Bukhari? Imam al-Bukhari, he says in his own terms, that before I included any hadith inside this Sahih, I prayed two rakahs of istikhara to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Should I include it? Should I not include it? So now, if we were to do this just upon the minimum number of hadith that Imam al-Bukhari included, how many, num how many rakats do you get? So let's just say Sahih al-Bukhari, it has about 7,700. You multiply that by two, what do you get? 15,400 is it? 14,000, no, 15,000, 15,400, 15,400. So you get 15,400 rakah. Now where did Imam al-Bukhari learn this from? This level of ibadah. Now subhanAllah, the, another point of reflection over here is, this is just salat al-istikhara. I want you to think about, if you include all of your fard prayers, include all of your sunnah prayers, would you reach 15,400 rakahs? That's very hard to imagine, very hard to imagine. And this is only salat al-istikhara for Imam al-Bukhari. Then you look at all of his other aspects and you notice that, you know, all of this righteousness is coming from his parents. Let us see how, let us see how. The first issue, Imam al-Bukhari's mother, rahimahullah, was a very righteous woman. We know of her righteousness just through one story. We don't know too much about her except for this one story. That Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, when uh, he was young, he lost his eyesight. He lost his eyesight. And this grieved his mother a lot. It grieved his mother a lot. And she would wake up every single night, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cry her eyes out, and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends her Ibrahim alayhi salam, the great prophet, the great messenger, to her in her dream, saying, you know what? Due to your worship, due to your crying, we have returned the eyesight of Muhammad bin Ismail, Imam al-Bukhari. And his eyesight was returned to him. So this concept of praying sunnah and nawafil prayers, it comes from his mother. That she prayed and he saw this at a very young age that this is what his mother was doing. He heard this throughout the night. Then I want you to look at the legacy of his father. The legacy of his father. Um, Ismail al-Bukhari, he was a great scholar of hadith himself. That Imam al-Bukhari, he writes his biography in his uh, Tariq al-Kabir. He says about his father that he was a student of Imam Malik. He was a Hamad ibn Zayd, he was a student of Abdullah ibn Mubarak. These three great scholars. So where did the love of hadith originally start from? It started from the parent itself, that his father was a scholar of hadith, and every male child will want to follow in his father's footsteps. The construction worker, his child will put on his construction boots and say, I want to become a construction worker. The doctor, his child will put on the white coat and say, I want to become a doctor. Similarly, the scholar of hadith, we saw that his son wanted to become a scholar of hadith as well. Now, the most beautiful thing about this is not the fact that he became a scholar of hadith, but the fact that what does Imam al-Bukhari's father say upon his deathbed? So he's asked on his deathbed, so what is it that you're leaving behind? Like, what is this great you know, contribution you left behind or what is it that you left behind to take care of your family. And he says something so powerful that subhanAllah, I almost think it's uh, impossible to implement in our times. He said, what I'm leaving behind is that I have not left behind a single dinar or a single dirham that came from a dubious source or from a haram source. Meaning that every single dinar, every single dirham I have is completely halal. So my father and my family never ate from haram, they never wore from haram, they never spent in haram. Everything was completely and legitimately 100% halal. And you notice that this has an effect on Imam al-Bukhari as well, rahimahullah, not only in terms of the barakah that Allah places in terms of the wealth, because Imam al-Bukhari, he sufficed off of his father's wealth for a long period of time in his uh, studying of hadith, but in the fact that Imam al-Bukhari, he learns from his father the importance of having halal and pure wealth. He learns the importance of having halal and pure wealth. So the deen, again, we bring it back to the issue of the parents, that it is very important that the, the parents are involved on the level of the deen itself. 
And I want to share something over here with you that what do we usually end up doing with our children? A lot of the times when we punish our children, we punish them with things that will more than likely make them hate the deen later on. So for example, a child is struggling in public school, he's a very bad kid, what do we do? We pull him out of the public school and we say, you know what, you're now going to Islamic school. You want to punish the child when he's been bad, what do you tell him to do? You've been very bad, go and read the Quran in the corner or go and read the Quran in your room. You look at the traditional Quran teachers, I mean, Alhamdulillah, the teachers at the ISC aren't like this, but I remember growing up myself, uh, yeah, I'm not going to mention where he was from, but SubhanAllah, he used to beat the hell out of me. And he, you didn't memorize something, he's taking the ruler and he's like breaking it on my hand. And SubhanAllah, growing up, it's like you become afraid to recite the Quran because you're like, you make any mistake, you're going to get beaten by this guy. So that's the one side of the spectrum. Let's look at the opposite end of, of, of the spectrum. And this is how it should be. And this is, for those of you who want to study this further, this is what you call positive anchoring. The psychological term for this is positive anchoring. So I want to give you the example of a five-year-old child. A five-year-old child, she's in one of my classes for Al-Maghrib, and she's like any other child. She's running around, creating havoc and chaos. Her parents are telling her, you know what, sit down, sit down. She's still running around. And then the point comes where the father gets upset. So I'm like, uh-oh, what's he going to do? At that time, he tells his daughter, you know what? If you run around one more time, I'm not going to let you read Quran tonight. On the inside, I started laughing. I'm like, what type of punishment is this? What a pansy punishment. You can't read Quran tonight. But subhanAllah, Allah taught me such a powerful lesson that day. That young girl, she started crying. Tears started coming down her eyes. And I was like, what on earth is going on? So I go and I speak to their parents and I ask them, you know, how did you get your child to love the Quran to such a degree that you tell the child you can't read Quran tonight and the child starts crying. They said what we did was, every time we wanted to celebrate, every time she achieved something good, we would go and read Quran as a family together. So she did well in the test, we would go and read some Quran. You know, she uh, uh, you know, learned how to ride a bike, we went and we read some Quran. Every time we would you know, go and buy, like, buy her a treat, buy her, bought her some cake, bought her some ice cream, before we would have that treat, we would read some Quran. So this child ends up loving the Quran, and then the way you end up punishing the child is not by saying go and read Quran, but by end up telling them, you know what, tonight you've been bad, so you can't read any Quran tonight. And that is like a generation of kids we would love to see. That they get affected by not doing those acts of worship, rather than being punished by doing those acts of worship. And this is the effect of positive anchoring. This is the effect of positive anchoring. So this is again, as an important point of a, as a parent, never use the deen to punish your child. Because they'll end up building negative connotations and neg negative affiliations, and they tie it into the deen. And then once they grow older, when they think about Quran, all they remember is the punishment of the rulers and the beatings. They're like, let's stay away from the Quran. Or they remember, you know, when it came to Salah, oh, I didn't pray. So then my father used to beat me up. And all of a sudden they grow older and they're like, you know what, I don't want to pray anymore because I have all these negative emotions tied to it. So rather than using negative emotions to tie them into the acts of the deen, use positive emotions and use positive enforcement to tie it into the deen. ta'ala. Now in terms of the deen itself, this is going to sound very radical. This is going to sound very radical. But I believe children need to be taught the whole Quran in terms of its memorization from a very young age. Even if it means pulling them out from school full time in kindergarten or in grade one or in grade two, whatever it may be, pull them out for two or three years, put, make them memorize the Quran beginning to end. And this is part of their Islamic learning process. And the benefits to this are numerous. I mean, if you look at any hafiz of the Quran that memorized the Quran when they were young, you'll notice that as they got older, they excelled in all aspects of life. Because going to memorize the Quran, it teaches you discipline. You need to have a set schedule. You need to go to school at a certain time. You need to memorize at a certain time. You need to revise at a certain time. You need to wake up early in the morning. So that's one aspect of it. Second aspect of it is the way that it broadens the mind in terms of memorization. That this young child now, when he's memorized the Quran, he's able to, you know, understand and grasp so many other concepts so much easier than other people or other children his age. So much more than other children his age. And the third element of this is the barakah. The third element of this is the barakah. That the child that has now memorized the Quran, 
This is a walking Quran. You know, people put the Quran in their cars, in their houses, because it brings barakah. Here you have a walking Quran. What more barakah could you want? You have someone to lead your salawat, someone that can correct you, as they get older, as they start understanding, you need proof for something, you ask your child, they'll give you the proof directly from the Quran. So that is the barakah. Now the reason why I say this sounds radical is because generally as parents, you're under the impression that you know what, the most important years of schooling are like the kindergarten, the grade ones, the grade two and grade three. But I'm telling you, even if your child gets left behind, they will catch up very, very quickly. And by the time they hit university, no one cares about the age anymore. It's only in like grade up to like, you know, high school that, oh, you know, you're a year older than us. It's a big deal. But once they get into university, nobody cares about your age. You could be two years older, you could be two years younger. It won't make a difference. It will not make a difference. And this is the importance that you force, not force, force is a bad word, but you highly encourage your children to memorize the Quran from a very, very young age so that ta'ala they can excel in other sciences later on. And this was the methodology of our predecessors, that before they taught them anything else, whether religious sciences or worldly sciences, they would teach their children the Qur'an. They would teach their children the Qur'an. So if you don't have children yet, then ta'ala think about how you can implement this in the life of your children. The third and last thing, the third and last thing that the child needs is education, is education. Now, this leads into a very long discussion that I don't have time for, but you get into three options. You have public school, you have homeschooling, and then you have Islamic school. Now looking at these three options, all of these three scenarios have pros and cons. And let's just quickly go through the pros and cons so you can be more educated when you make this decision. Going to public school, I would say, is the worst decision that you can make. There's a, a book or an article called Lambs to the Slaughter. Lambs to the slaughter. It's about the deficiencies of the public school system. On how public school is one of the worst decisions a parent can make for their child. One is that you're putting them in an institution which does not promote religion. So they grow up atheist by definition. Number two, the environment that they're in is completely un-Islamic. So when they come home swearing, when they come home, you know, wanting to have a girlfriend and boyfriend, all of a sudden, that influence, it came from the, their, their peers around them. And then three, the quality of education, I actually find to be poorest in public education. The quality of education, in my opinion, a lot of the times, not always, a lot of the times is poorest in public education. The positives of public education is that your children learn to intermingle and deal well, intermingle with people in general. And number two, they learn to deal with fitna from a young age. And this is an important concept, that there's a dangerous aspect to it, but there's a positive aspect to it as well. The dangerous aspect of it is that it's not controlled, and they aren't disciplined when dealing with the fitna. And then the positive aspect of it is the statement of Amr ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, where he says, يَنْقُدُ عِيرَ الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةً عُرْوَةً إِذَا نَشَأَ فِي الْإِسْلَامَ نَا يَعْرَفُ الْجَاهِلِيَةً That the pillars of Islam continue to fall pillar by pillar, if a person is raised in Islam, not knowing the evils of jahiliyyah. Meaning that once the child sees the wickedness and the futility of this jahili way of life, then that naturally encourages him and enforces him to have a more righteous life because he's already seen the evil and facade. So that is one uh, other positive aspect of it as well. We move on to Islamic school. We move on to Islamic school. Now when I'm speaking about Islamic school, I'm not speaking about Calgary per se because mashallah, we have a, you know, good Islamic school options. But I'm speaking about generally across North America, when you look at Islamic schooling, what ends up happening? Number one is that the funding is very poor for it. So the facilities are not as good as they would be in other programs or in other systems. Number two, since the funding is poor, usually the caliber of the teachers is not that good because they can only get the teachers that are desperate and not teachers that actually want to end up teaching there. The third thing that you notice about Islamic school is what I was talking about previously, that children who go to Islamic school, they end up taking their Islam for granted because they're not exposed to evils and fits and of the public school system. So as they get older, once they hit university, all of a sudden they want to become that rebellious child. Hey, I didn't get to experience the girlfriend when I was in elementary school and high school. Now I'm in university, let me go ahead and experience it. So that is that rebellion factor that takes place. The positive aspects of Islamic school is 
Number one, that your child is brought up in an Islamic environment. The fact that they're around other Muslims, the fact that they're taught Islamic studies, the fact that they're taught, the fact that they're taught Arabic and Quran, the fact that they're taught how to pray in school and encouraged how to pray in school, this is something that has no value to it. I mean, even if you paid a million dollars for it, this concept alone is worth more than that million dollars. So this is a very important aspect. A second positive aspect of Islamic school is that your, the, the friends that your child will have at this age of like high school and a bit older are generally the friends that they'll end up retaining. Elementary school is not as important, but high school and university, the friends that you make at that time are usually the friends that you'll end up attaining, retaining for the rest of your life. So now that you have Muslim friends in high school, ta'ala, you'll have Muslim company as well throughout the rest of your life. The third positive aspect of this is that the stress on the parents for this duration of time is a bit less. They don't have to worry too much about outside influences because generally speaking, the Islamic schools will be good. Now you move to the third one, which is homeschooling, which is homeschooling. Homeschooling, let's talk about the negatives first. Number one, is that it is extremely burdensome upon the parents. Generally speaking, when they go to public school or Islamic school, the parents only have to be involved about 50% of the time. And that's a very important number to understand. 50% of the time is you know, the parents being involved. With, with homeschooling, now you've almost doubled that. We would say 90 to 100%, that is the involvement of the parent. So if the parent doesn't have the background in this, they don't have the patience for this, they don't have the education for this, you're leading your child towards failure. You're leading your child towards failure. The second negative aspect about this is the social environment. That being homeschooled, you're not around too many other kids. So you're usually around your own siblings or maybe you know, one or two other children if you're doing uh, group homeschooling. But so they become socially inadequate, that they're not as social as the other children. And this, as they grow older, it becomes a hindrance because they want to be as good as public, at public speaking, at doing you know, public activities. They won't know how to interact and this becomes a hindrance. Also indirectly related to this is the level of confidence. Usually the more children a child is around, the more confident he will grow. And the less children he is around, the less confidence he will have. That is the negative aspects of this. The positive aspect of this, is that you as a parent are 100% in control of what your child will learn. You want to filter something out, you can go ahead and filter it out. Number two, is that you can speed up and slow down the progress of your child based upon what you will. And subhanAllah, this is something like, you know, we're testing out right now. Alia, my, my oldest daughter, she's four years old, turning five in April, bithinlahi ta'ala. But in terms of a math level, she's already doing like grade two and grade three stuff. So that in math, like we've excelled just to try it out to see how it goes. And then you notice that SubhanAllah, at a young age, while the public school system fears, you know, you can't teach them too advanced stuff, it'll overwhelm them. Ali is accepting this and, you know, is embracing it. So you can f slow up, uh, sorry, slow down or speed up the progress of your child. And, you know, that obviously has its benefits as well. And then the third benefit is in terms of Islamic studies, especially if you have you know, control over your Islamic education, then you can give your child the appropriate Islamic education that they need as well with the night ta'ala. And you can balance between memorization of the Quran and the deen, as well as teaching them their secular sciences as well. So this in theory is a summary of the pros and cons of your child's education. And every parent needs to study the pros and cons before they have children. Not when they start hitting four, five, and six, study the pros and cons before they have children. In fact, if you ever get a job and you have to move to a new city, make this one of the requirements that you study, the schooling systems in those cities, in those localities, before you decide to move to that area or not. Now it's almost eight o'clock and we didn't even get into our second subject yet. Um, so we'll leave it for another time, bithilnahi ta'ala. But the next two sections, we'll leave this for a separate lecture, are distractions for the child and mistakes that parents make when dealing with children. And I just want to share one mistake, and this will be the last thing that we'll mention, and I'll share some titles of books with you, bithilnahi ta'ala. A big mistake that parents make when dealing with their children is in terms of the language that they use. And I'm not even talking about the cursing and the swearing, that's something that you shouldn't be doing anyways. But what I'm talking about is positive and negative affirmation. So a lot of the times a child is running down around in the masjid, what is the initial reaction of the parent? The initial reaction of the parent is to tell the child, you know what, don't run in the masjid or and don't do that. A child's mind does not comprehend the negative. 
It's not mature enough to comprehend the negative. And that is why you'll see that a lot of the times when you tell the child, don't do this, they actually go ahead and continue this. It's not because they want to rebel against you, it's just because their mind is not mature enough to understand a negative command yet. So one of the ways of dealing with your children is that if they're running around in the masjid, rather than telling them don't run around, use the positive affirmation by telling them, sit down. So if positive is a command which they will easy, more easily understand and their mind will comprehend. And that is why if you were to take a child and tell one child don't run around and tell another child sit down, you're more likely to be successful with the child that you use positive affirmation with by telling sit down rather than telling the child don't run. So you want to use this in all aspects of your communication with your child is that eliminate all the don'ts and try to enforce all of the do's. And bidin ta'ala, it is a challenge at the in the beginning, but it has a much more positive effect in terms of the level that you're able to control your child per se bidin lahi ta'ala. Um, and that's like a major mistake. So now let us talk about books. Let us talk about books. The first book is How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. And this point that I just shared in terms of positive and negative affirmation is directly taken from this book. This is a very, very important book that before parents become parents, they should read this so that they learn how to communicate with their children and can have the proper influence over them. Um, and this is by Adil Faber and Elaine Mazalish. That's that book right there. The second book is... One, two, three, magic. And this has nothing to do with magic before someone flips. It has nothing to do with magic. But it's talking about effective discipline for children, two to 13. Effective discipline for two to 13. So parents living in the West, you face a lot of challenges in disciplining your child. You know, from an Islamic perspective, are you allowed to hit your child? Or are you not allowed to hit your child? From a legal perspective, are you allowed to hit your child? Or are you not allowed to hit your child? This book takes a completely different approach and that is how to discipline your child without physically touching them at all. So they use the concept of pain and pleasure in terms of using discipline. So for example, your child, you know, let's just say you establish a love of going to the library. A love of going to the library. And this is something I tried out. That they have a love of going to the library. This is their fun activity for the week. So to discipline them, instead of doing anything physical, you just tell them, you know what? We're not going to go to the library this week and this is their discipline. Because you've taken something that is pleasurable and turned it into something painful and that way it causes the same effect in terms of disciplining them. So it teaches some very cool techniques and this is by Thomas W. Fellin. Thomas W. Fellin. And then the third is actually a set. The third is actually a set. And this is very, very important because this is, you know, a husband and wife qualified psychologists that have written a book on Islamic parenting. They've written books on Islamic parenting. And that is Dr. Ikram and Muhammad Rida Bashir. Dr. Ikram and Muhammad Rida Bashir. So they have one on parenting skills as Muslims. And then the second two are frequently asked questions uh, about parenting. Frequently asked questions on parenting. So the name again is Dr. Ikram and Muhammad Rida Bashir. So this is uh, in terms of recommended reading for parenting bidinlahi ta'ala. Now we move on to the second subject. Or actually, you know what? Let's do Q&A on, on parenting first. Then we'll, I know we're going to have quite a few questions on divorce. So any questions on parenting? We'll take three questions inshallah. Something I said that needs to be repeated, something that you didn't understand, or anything that you'd like further information on. Parenting, go ahead. Um, what the issue is about putting a two dates uh, so we, we are kind of concluded that it was uh, majority of the it was done for Al Tabarruk uh, As Tabarruk, yeah so, and it wasn't the majority of the opinion but that was the opinion that I gave preference to okay, uh, so what, what then we should conclude is that something should practice or we should understand that this was the Tabarruk so we don't have, we right. have to do it or so in my personal opinion that this was something exclusive to the Messenger of Allah and it's something that should not be practiced so while they mention it, a lot of scholars will mention it, it's important to be educated about it as well. Because if you look at this, we never saw this from Abu Bakr, we never saw this from Umar, it was only seen from the Messenger of Allah Wasallam that, that parents would bring their children, the Messenger of Allah would chew on a date and put it on the palate of the mouth. And it seems that this was for the sake of tabarruk and not for the sake of some sort of medical benefit or anything of that nature. And Allah knows best. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. To, to memorize the Qur'an yeah. Yeah, at a very young age. So they should be 
taught memorization of the Quran, we want to aim that before the age of 10, they finish the memorization of the Quran. That is an aspect to it. That is an aspect to it. And if you live in Canada, that is something you have to deal with the consequences of. But this is where, you know, homeschooling comes into play. Where you can give, uh, in your curriculum, give much more of an emphasis on memorization of the Quran than on, you know, the secular sciences. And that's what I would recommend is if it ever becomes a legal aspect and you are considering, you know, giving your child the memorization of the Quran, for the first couple of years, go the homeschooling route and heavily emphasize the memorization of the Quran and just barely get them by on the other sciences and then after you can flip it you can go into like overdrive mode in the secular sciences when they already have their Islamic base because what we're trying to do is give their, the children an Islamic base first and then build on that Islamic base a secular base when you do the opposite it's like destruction for the child Allah knows best go ahead yeah Excellent. So the brother's question is when we were talking about uh, the inherent state of mubah is that when you do something which is permissible, there's no reward and no punishment. And the brother asked, what if a person has a righteous intention? And the answer to this is that yes, any act that is mubah, which is accompanied by a righteous intention, becomes an act of ibadah. So a person goes to sleep with the intention of waking up for fajr or waking up to have energy to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that sleep now becomes an act of ibadah. Excellent. Any last questions before we move on? Of this course. Time, I think uh, the only motivation to take away or like, give kids motivation yeah. is iPod and iPhones. iPods and iPhones, <laughs> which is followed by the father's version that I paid. Allah <laughs> 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 I mean, technology is so dangerous, subhanAllah. I mean, I'm just going to go on a, a small tangent. I encourage reading a book by Neil Postman called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Amusing Ourselves to Death. And this is how technology and entertainment they destroy the attention span of the individual. I want you to think about when you watch TV. When you watch TV, does anyone have a guess how frequently they change the camera angle or the camera shot? Anyone know? Eight, huh? seconds. Eight seconds is too much. Usually on average four to six seconds is the longest the camera will stay still. Because if they end up doing longer than four to six seconds, the brain these days is like, this is getting too boring. I need to, you know, change. It's like your brain is on crack. And that is why you look at the, I mean, this is final. It's, it is funny and entertaining, but it's so sad that now when you have your average teenager, they need to be listening to something. They need to be typing something at the same time and maybe, you know, playing a video game at the same time. So all of this constant stimulation, now when that's taken away and you try to get this person to read a book, it's impossible. They don't know how to relate to it. They'll read half a page and they're like, I can't focus, I can't concentrate. And then what do we do? We start giving them, you know, Ritalin and all these other drugs to help them concentrate. So now this book is, you know, is written back in the 80s, but it's very applicable to our times on how technology and entertainment, it destroys the mind of an individual, particularly in terms of its uh, attention span. Khair, Jazakallah khair. With that having been said, let's move on to the issue of divorce. Let us move on to the issue of divorce. And this is where I'll share my joke with you. So, you know, there's three rings that you will be sharing when you get married. You have the engagement ring, then you have the marriage ring, and then you have the suffering. <laughs> okay, good. Now, let us move on in terms of dealing with marital problems, dealing with marital problems. Ideally speaking, I would have loved to have spent a whole halaqa on this, but we're gonna spend 15 minutes with Allahi Ta'ala. The first thing to realize is that every marriage will have some sort of dispute and some sort of problem. It is impossible to have a marriage that will be free from this. If you have a marriage that is free from this, there's something wrong with that marriage. It is an abnormal marriage where the husband and wife do not dispute and do not argue. We saw this in the life of the Messenger of Allah. We saw this in the life of the companions. It is just human nature. That is the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand is you need to understand causes behind this problem. Causes behind the problem. And that's what we discussed last week. That understand the opposite gender and bidhin lahi ta'ala will help you understand the root cause of the problem. It will help you understand the root cause of the problem. So focus on the root cause of the problem rather than the symptoms itself. Now with that having been said, let us just say you've done that and your marriage is still in turmoil. You're still struggling inside your marriage. What do you do at that time? The first step is advising your spouse. The Messenger of Allah in one of the most 
I guess, explicit hadith, he says, nasiha, that this religion is sincere advice to one another. And after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the Muslim rulers, no one is more deserving of this than your spouse. No one is more deserving of this of your spouse. So you need to have a sit down with them and tell them, look, I don't like the way you speak to me. I don't like the way you act. I don't like this habit that you have. We need to find a way to change it up. So this is the first thing that needs to be done. So as soon as there's a problem, address the problem right away. Don't be like an ostrich. The ostrich it puts its heads in the sand and it thinks the rhinoceros will disappear. But the second is ostrich raises its head, all of a sudden, bang, it gets hit by the rhinoceros. And that's what happens with problems in your marriage, that you ignore them for so long till it becomes a huge mountain and you can't deal with it anymore. So as soon as a problem arises, openly advise one another and communicate one another. Number two, is let us just say this advice does not work. This advice does not work. What do you do then? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us to separate in the beds. He tells us to separate in the beds. The wisdom behind this is, is that once an individual has gotten accustomed to love and to care and to tenderness, then absence makes the hearts grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. So when you separate from the beds, you will naturally be willing to compromise on your position and bidin lahi ta'ala, that will help in the reconciliation. Another point to understand is, we spoke briefly last week about anger, and I want you to remember those points, that the number one rule when you're married is that the both spouses should never be angry at the same time. Only one should be allowed to be angry at one given time and be given their opportunity, yet both of them should never be angry at the same time. So the separation doesn't work. So now let's just say if separation doesn't work, what should happen at that time? We introduce arbitration. And if you remember the things to be discussed, is that before the marriage, you guys should discuss that. If we have a marriage problem, who is going to arbitrate our solution? You agree upon an imam, you agree upon two good righteous individuals, that they are going to negotiate on our behalf and we will accept their negotiation. Now, let's just say the third case scenario doesn't work either. The third case scenario, it doesn't work either. What do you resort to in that time? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a way out and that is what we call divorce. That is what we call divorce. Now, I want to share the sunnah way of getting divorced, and then we'll talk about mistakes that people make. The sunnah way of getting divorced, then we'll talk about mistakes that people make. So the sunnah way of getting divorced, the first thing that you need to understand is that divorce within of itself is something permissible and is not something that is disliked within of itself. It can become disliked and it can become haram based upon why a person is doing it. It can become disliked and it can become haram based upon why a person is doing it. That is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the woman that asks for divorce without a very uh, valid reason will not smell the fragrance of paradise, will not smell the fragrance of paradise. So that sort of divorce, it can become haram. So now, the sunnah way of getting divorced. Number one is that the sunnah way of getting divorced is not something that is done on the spot. It is not something that is done on the spot. Can we get a chair for Sheikh Hassan, inshallah? Mm -hmm. Sheikh Hassan, please come and join me. You're going to come inside? Go inside. Jazakallah khair. Um, so the first thing that needs to be understood about the sunnah way of getting divorced is that it is not something that is done on the spot. So what does this mean? That in our day and age, Assalamu alaikum everyone. All of these people are all focused over here. <laughs> Time. The sunnah way of getting divorced is that it is not something that is done on the spot. In our day and age, husband gets angry, before he even thinks, he's like, Anti talaka, you're divorced. You know, that's it. But from a Sunnah perspective, a divorce is meant to be delayed and it is not done instantaneously. So that is the first aspect of the Sunnah. The second aspect of the Sunnah is how long should a person wait before pronouncing divorce to their spouse? How long should a person wait before pronouncing divorce to his spouse? It is encouraged that you wait one menstrual cycle and one purity. So you wait till her menstrual cycle and you wait till she becomes pure. That is how long you should wait before you pronounce the divorce. Meaning that you don't do it in a direct state of anger. So you can almost end up waiting close to like 40 days. Because if you, you know, the problem happens the day after she becomes pure, you wait till the next menstrual cycle and next purity, you're almost waiting 40 days there. So you would wait that long before you pronounce the divorce. That is condition number two. That this is the length it is encouraged to wait. Condition number three is that during that time where you're contemplating divorce, you should not have marital relations with your spouse. 
during that time where you're contemplating divorce, you should not have marital relations with your spouse. So during that periods of purity that you have, that you're waiting, you do not have marital relations. And then the fourth and last aspect of the sunnah is that when you do pronounce divorce, you pronounce the divorce once. So you say you are divorced or I am free from you or go back to the house of your family. Any word that can clearly be understood that you are separating from your wife, it should only be said once and should not be said three times. If any of these rules are not ab uh, abided by, then that divorce is still valid, but the husband is sinful at that time. So for example, he divorces her during a state of menstruation, or he divorces her during a time where he has had marital intercourse with her in the time of purity. Or, um, you know, the, the, the husband, he divorces his wife three times in one sitting. All of these scenarios, the divorce is still valid, but the husband is sinful for divorcing his wife in such a manner. He's sinful for divorcing his wife in such a manner. So now directly related to this is things that people do wrong. So divorcing three times in one go, that is you know, very, very common. That the second the husband gets upset, all of a sudden he tells his wife, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced. That is not correct. That is not the way to go about it. The second thing, it should not be instantaneous, but it is a logical conclusion that to. Not an emotional one, a logical one. And that is why the Sharia gives so much time. Number three, that they shouldn't have had marital relations in that time. And number four, and this is an important one, uh, this is unrelated to what was mentioned previously, that during the period of the Idda, and the Idda is the waiting period where the wife will wait, where she is still his wife, but he's not allowed, or sorry, he's not supposed to have marital relations with her. If he does, it means he has taken her back. So during this period of the Idda, during the first divorce, it is three menstrual cycles and three purities. The reason why it's important to know the three menstrual cycles and three purities. Does the woman spend the idda in her house or in her husband's house? Who can tell me? Where is the woman meant to spend the idda? In her house? Incorrect. She is meant to spend the idda in the house of her husband. So she lives with her husband just like they would normally live, except for the fact that they don't have marital relations. Now who can point out the obvious wisdom behind this? What is the obvious wisdom behind this? Very easy to reconcile. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants reconciliation for the couple. And that is why the period of the idda should be done in the husband's house. In the husband's house. And this is how you understand on how heavy the sharia focuses on this concept of reconciliation and taking the talaq very seriously. You know, there's things that you do not joke about in Islam. From those things is the talaq. That the talaq should not be joked about. It is something that is always taken seriously. And that is why you see that the sharia puts such heavy conditions. So now, talaq can be done three times. So husband and wife have a fight. He divorces her once and he does it according to the sunnah. He can take her back. If it's during the period of the idda, a new marriage contract is not needed. If it's after the period of the idda is over three menstrual cycles and three purifications, he would need a new marriage contract at that time, and that's perfectly fine. This is valid for the first two talaqs. When he's done talaq once, he's done talaq twice. He has that period of three months to take her back. If he decides to take her back after the three months, after the three menstrual cycles and purification, he needs a new contract. Now, after he has given her talaq the third time, this is no longer applies. The only way he can take her back at that time is that if she normally and legally gets married to someone else, consummates that marriage, and has a normal and legal divorce, then he can uh, uh, re-propose, and if she accepts again, then they would have to have a, a, a legal marriage contract again. So it shows you the emphasis of how Easy and difficult, Allah makes it. Easy in terms of reconciliation and easy if you need a genuine way out. But if you become abusive of the divorce, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates it as a sort of punishment. That you abuse the divorce and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it difficult for you to get remarried again. Now divorce is the right of the man. Divorce is the right of the man. Now what if you have a woman that doesn't want to be married? In this case, we have something called khula. In this case, we have something called khula. And just before we get to that, let me mention something importantly over here, is that in divorce, 
um, the woman's mahar, it becomes compulsory. So if the marriage has not been consummated and she is divorced, then she is entitled to half of her dowry. If the marriage has become consummated, then she is entitled to her entire dowry. She is entitled to her entire dowry when she gets uh, divorced. Now in the case of khula, this is when the woman requests from the man that I would like separation from you. So Thabit ibn Qais, one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, he got married to a woman. This woman comes up to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and she says, Ya Rasulullah, I fear that I will be unable to fulfill his rights because I do not find him attractive anymore. I do not find him attractive anymore. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I want you to look at this. He didn't say, you know, why don't you try to reconcile? Or why don't you wait till you find him attractive again? He didn't do that. He understood that this woman was genuine, she was sincere, she was honest, she wanted to stay away from oppressing her husband. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, found a way out for her. He tells Thabit ibn Qais that let her go and that she would have to return the mahar, or in this case it was a garden, she would have to return the garden back to Thabit ibn Qais. So in the case of Al-Khula, where the wife requests for separation, the wife would return back her dowry on the condition that the husband grants her her freedom. Now the scholars differ that if you look at this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells Thabit ibn Qais that grant her talaq. Does he have to give her talaq or does he just have to say that you are separated from me on khula? Allah knows best. It seems that he would say to her that you're separated on khula rather than using the word talaq over here because there may be some sort of confusion. And this is the opinion of the Hanbali Madhab and Allah knows best. Now in the case of the khula, there's two things that change. In the divorce, the woman has to go through iddah for three menstrual cycles and three purifications. And number two, she gets her dowry incomplete. In the case of the khula, the woman has to return her dowry. And then on top of that, her iddah is only one month. Her iddah is only one month. Is everyone clear on this? Everyone clear? Now we move on to the issue of maintenance and custody. Maintenance and custody. During the period of the idda, it is compulsory upon the man to continue to provide for the woman. Provide the shelter, provide the food, provide the clothing, and any other necessity that she has. Any other necessity that she has. Once the idda is over, the woman is not, um, does not have the right to this financial maintenance anymore. She does not have the right to this financial maintenance anymore. This is in the scenario when there are no children. This is in the scenario when there are no children. Now we come to the scenario of children. The man is responsible to provide for his wife and for the children up until they reach the age of puberty. Up and until the children reach the age of puberty. So is that clear? The man has to continue to provide once they have children up until the age of puberty. Particularly in our times, especially if a woman is looking after the children and she can't work, then he's even more obliged to provide for her, for her needs and even some of her wants. So there's no set amount that he would be paying, but it was something that they would both agree upon where her needs are met and even some of her wants would be met as well. So that is in terms of maintenance. And then in terms of custody, in terms of custody, the general case scenario is that the children will go to the mother up and until she gets married. Up and until she gets married. So the children will go with the mother up and until she decides to get married. After that time, they will go to the father in that situation. They will go to the father in that situation. Now the important thing to understand over here is that when it comes to custody, it should not become a battle of the parents but it should be about who can provide the best upbringing for the child. And this is something that gets lost, that divorces, when they're not done according to the sunnah, they get filled with so much hatred and so much animosity that the children end up suffering. And the children are not given their rights and they're not taken care of properly, and then they end up getting abused and they actually become a tool of manipulation. That the father will try to make the children hate the mother, the mother will try to make the children hate the father. And this should not be the case at all. The parents should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not impose this upon their children. So that is the case of custody. And the main thing in the custody issue is whoever can provide the best Islamic upbringing as well as, you know, general upbringing towards the children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Let's conclude with questions. Insha'Allah ta'ala. I'll take three questions related to divorce. Go ahead. 
Uh, yes. So the sunnah, so the brother's question is that he was reading something and he was talking about sunnah divorce and bid'ah divorce. Sunnah divorce is what I explained to you, and bid'ah divorce is all those things that I mentioned that the divorce is still valid, but a person will be sinful for doing them. That is what they call a uh, talaq bid'i. Okay. That is what is talaq bid'i. Two questions, go ahead. Um, let's say that a person is angry and he just says that you are talaq. Yes. Is he allowed to take you back? Or, uh, right, so if he's on. Right. So in, if he's doing this the first time or the second time, he can take her back. It's not a problem. If he's done this the third time, then after that time, he can't take her back. Now, the issue with anger, you know, this is like the most common question I get asked. Literally. I don't know how many times a week. I divorced my wife in a state of anger. Is my divorce valid? I want to, people to logically think about this question. Is there any person that will divorce his wife and he'll be like, ha 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 ha, I'm having a good time. You're divorced, by the way. Divorce happens in a state of anger. The exemption for divorce where the person is not held accountable is that the person is in such a state of anger that he no longer has control over himself. That he becomes like, you know the Incredible Hulk? He turns all green and he rips his clothes and he goes psychotic. In that case, yes, we would find a way out that this person has a serious temper issue. Khalas, maybe we'll make an exemption for him. His talaq would not be valid. But the general case scenario is that a husband divorces his wife in a state of anger. Now, if you don't know how to control your anger, that's your problem. If you don't want to divorce your wife according to the sunnah, that's your problem. This is the punishment for going against the sunnah. So in such a situation, first and second time is fine. But third time, he would have to go through that process where she would have to get married again and then divor uh, consummate, and then get divorced, and then he can propose to her. What about the I'm not talking about that right now. I said two questions. So these are the last questions right now. Uh, these are the last questions, so no more hands. So one, two, three, four, and five, fine, that's it. Let's start with our right, go ahead. So uh, is there any sunnah sun you need to follow uh, in case having a divorce without dukhna? Any sunnah that you need to follow? So in such a situation, um, this actually requires a lot of fiqh, that what is, does Islam quantify as dukhla, consummation. So the Jumhur al-Ulama, they said, if a man is alone with his wife and he has the ability to do dukhla, this counts as dukhla, whether he did dukhla or not. Right? This is called al-Jumhur. You have a, another group of scholars that said, no, it actually has to be the physical act itself. So putting this fiqh issue aside, let's just say they've agreed that, you know, there was no dukhla. In such a situation, her idda would only be one month. And the dowry is given, uh, half of the dowry is given to her. Half of the dowry would be given to her. And Allah knows best. Who is next? Go ahead. So what, if, what happens if like, the girl wants to pull out, right? And yeah. the husband, for example, doesn't want to give it to her. And he's doing something like, her, like oppresses her in some sense, like abuses her or harasses her or whatnot. Right. What Excellent. So the key thing, the husband needs to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The husband, he should not abuse this right. Now in the Muslim country, what would end up happening, she ends up going to the Muslim judge or the Muslim ruler, and then the Muslim judge or the Muslim ruler will grant her that khula. And that's an you know, easy done case. Now living in the West, it becomes you know, a different case scenario. We don't have a Qadi, we don't have a Muslim ruler. What does she end up doing? In such a situation, the Imam will try to get involved and try to encourage the husband, go ahead and give her the talaq, give her that separation. In extreme circumstances, the Imam may even step in and give her the khula uh, as acting as the Qadi or acting as you know, the, 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 the Muslim ruler at that time. But this is in a very rare case scenario. And in fact, this is a very burdensome position to be in as an Imam. When you have a situation where the wife wants khula and she has a valid reason but the man will not give it to her, it's like a catch-22 over here. It's like you're stuck in a hard place. And we would advise the brothers to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be just at all times. Allah knows best. That's what he was asking as well. This is a completely different long fiqh issue. Yani the ulama have discussed this from the time of the Sahaba. That does three talaqs equal one or does three talaqs equal three? And I would suggest go study a fiqh of talaq course. I'm not giving an answer on that. Allah knows best. Or ask me privately and I'll give you my opinion. I'm not going to state it in public. Go ahead. Uh, so from your experience today, what are the biggest reasons some Muslim couples are choosing to divorce? Divorce? Excellent. The number one reason why people are getting divorced is compatibility. Compatibility is the number one issue. So a man gets married based upon looks, the woman gets married on the assumption that she's going to be pampered and taken care of, the honeymoon phase finishes, and lo and behold, you're married to a monster. In that situation, they realize 
He wants to be a practicing righteous person. She wants to become like going out and partying. They're no longer compatible, different goals, different ambitions. So that's the number one thing. Number two is when egos come into play. So for example, um, people who are end up, yani, they're very sensitive and they end up abusing their relationship to you know, just boost their own ego. That's the second thing. Number three, finances come into play. Finances come into play, that's a huge thing. You know, the husband feels threatened that my, his wife is earning more than him. It damages his ego. That becomes another case uh, problem. So those are the three biggest things. Compatibility, ego, and finance. And then you can add maybe number four, the role of the in-laws. That's always, especially in the, you know, the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that's like a huge issue all the time where people will be, end up getting divorced. So those are like the four primary reasons and Allah knows best. Was there someone that I skipped? I, I skipped you two. I apologize. Go ahead. Let's go with him first. I have a question here. Is uh, about the mahar. Yes. Uh, when you get married uh, at that time, do we have to pay hundred percent, or it can be delayed? No. I discussed this in detail in the first lecture, so you can get the detailed response in the first lecture. In summary, it needs to be specified at that time what the mahar is going to be, but it can be delayed till a later date. It can be delayed till a later date, but a man should not leave the woman hanging. He shouldn't say indefinitely that I will give you your mahar, but rather it should be specified within five years, within three years, or something along those lines. He shouldn't leave it hanging altogether. And Allah knows best. Last question. And related to the question, like, uh, the talaq word, while angry, or tied with the, with the yameen? Like if, so explain the yameen part. Is it, you are talaq? Yeah. And the talaq, Right. So according to the majority of scholars, if you have a conditional talaq where the man says, if you were to do this, you were divorced, or if you were not to do, do this, you are divorced. According to the majority of the scholars, this talaq is valid. That the second she does that act, or the second she doesn't do that act, then she would be divorced one talaq at that time. And just, this is not, not my question. My question is... Astaghfirullah, <laughs> ya Astaghfirullah. <laughs> I got tricked, man. Go ahead. <laughs> Pregnant and the and she's hiding this like it's mentioned in the Quran. That's not right. So the idda for a pregnant woman is until she delivers the baby. So the pre woman who is pregnant, her idda will last until she delivers the baby. And yes, as you mentioned, she's not allowed to hide the pregnancy. She's not allowed to hide the pregnancy. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. I'll conclude with recommending a book for the fiqh of divorce. Actually, two books I'll recommend to Allah Ta'ala. Number one, I know we have at the 8th uh, and 8th location, it's called Minhaj al-Muslim. Minhaj al-Muslim, we have this. There's a detailed section on divorce and how to do it according to the sunnah, what is allowed, what is not allowed. You can research it over there. If you don't uh, research this, and this is advice particularly for the sisters, there's a three-volume encyclopedia on the fiqh of women. Three-volume encyclopedia of women. There's no name of the author on this, but it's published by the Dar es Salaam research team. Dar es Salaam research team. Ta'ala, there's a detailed section on talaq and khula and your rights and all that thing. Three volumes, uh, fiqh, uh, encyclopedia of the fiqh of women. You can look it up over there as well. And most importantly, I would suggest, and this is my final concluding advice, just like any profession in life, you know, you want to become a doctor, you want to become an engineer, you go through years and years of education before you become qualified for that. Your marriage, your deen is even more critical to be studied. So take your marriage, take your deen just as seriously and even more seriously. So before you get into marriage, learn about rights and responsibilities. Learn about the sunnah way of living with your, life, with your wife. Learn about the sunnah way of divorcing your wife. Learn about what is allowed, what it isn't allowed. And this will resolve so many problems when problems arise. The biggest problem that people have is that when problems arise, they don't know what to do. So they start making emotional decisions. And that's what creates the chaos. That rather than thinking logically, rather than following the sunnah, they're just following their desires and following their emotions, wanting to cause the most amount of pain and hurt possible. And this is when people become oppressive and extremely sinful. And that's what you want to stay away from, bidinlahi ta'ala. May Allah protect us and bless us and accept from us. This is my last halaqa, bidinlahi ta'ala. We've concluded the series moving forward as a community. Starting from next week, Shaykh Hassan, bidinlahi ta'ala, will be taking over. I want to thank all of you for attending and for you know, being uh, good students. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.